So let me show you how we can build a model of ADHD from the neuroanatomy and neuropsychology of ADHD. To understand ADHD, we have to understand how normal self-control develops, and then we'll show where ADHD affects it. There are three concepts that we need to build this model. One, inhibition. You have to stop and build a pause in your behavior. As your mother said, stop and think before you act, and the stopping comes first. Or as Rabelais said, everything comes to those who can wait. But whoever said it, the fact is that what distinguishes human cognition from all other species is we wait. We can decouple an event, a stimulus, from our response to that event. Other species cannot do that. And by decoupling them, we can do things in the delay that others cannot do. But the first thing we have to do is stop. Now, inhibition can be defined as three separate capacities, all of which are impaired in patients with ADHD. The first is the ability to inhibit the urge to respond on the moment to the event. This is the impulsiveness, the disinhibition. The second, however, is the ability to interrupt an ongoing behavior when it's time to do something else. That's the perseveration, and that is also an inhibitory failure. You can't stop what you were doing, particularly if it was interesting, if it was rewarding, to shift to something more important, but where the consequences might be delayed. Finally, there is the ability to protect your frontal lobes, your working memory, your what and when systems from distraction, from interference, from being perverted, disrupted, and distorted by events around you that have nothing to do with the goal you're pursuing. You must be able to suppress those unwanted reactions. Notice that the distractibility in ADHD is not a perceptual issue. It is an inhibition problem. People with ADHD don't perceive distractors any more than others. The difference is they respond to them. They get up and they react to the irrelevant event, and now they're off task. And once they're off task, they can't retain the goal, so now they won't return to the task. So it's simply a series of responding to irrelevant events in life, which is why it is so hard to accomplish your goals. All three of these are failures of the inhibition system. And people with ADHD, as we well know, have trouble with all three. Now, the next concept we need to build up our model is not just inhibition, but self-regulation. What is it? Self-regulation is very simply defined, as it was 40 years ago by Skinner and others, as involving three steps. The fourth step we've already talked about. You've got to stop. But having stopped, you will now direct a behavior back at yourself. You will engage in some action that is aimed at you, not at the world, not at others, back at yourself. You're doing something. What are you doing? You're trying to change your behavior from what it would have been had you simply responded on impulse. So there's a form of self-change going on here. I'm acting on myself to change my next response. Well, why would I want to do that? To change a distant consequence. I am trying to alter the future. I am not trying to change the now. In fact, I may use this as an opportunity to turn away from the seductions of the moment, from the immediate rewards, the feel-good aspect of life. I may turn away from that and subject myself to adversity and poverty for years to change that future. It's called going to college. <laughs> You've given up the job, the money, the car, the clothes, the babes, and everything, right? And you're going to live in poverty for at least four years because if you can get that degree, you're going to earn ten to $15,000 more a year than people who didn't. That's a distant consequence. All deferred gratification requires self-regulation. Action to the self that's changing yourself, that's altering your future. Okay? Now, the third concept we have to discuss is what, then, is an executive function. We've been talking about the executive system, but we haven't defined it. Now, this is interesting because if you look anywhere in neuropsychology, there is no definition. I've looked. I actually wrote a review paper seven years ago on the amorphous nature of the concept. No one defines it. They will give you a list of tests they think that measure it, like Wisconsin card sort, right? 
or they will give you a list of what they think are the functions themselves. Inhibition, nonverbal working memory, verbal working memory, the central executive, and so on. That's just a list, right? That's not a definition. So let's operationally define it. In my theory of ADHD, we define an executive function as what you're doing to yourself, the action to the self. That first step in our definition of self-regulation, that is an executive function, an action to the self designed to change you so as to change your future. And there are five actions that humans will direct at themselves, which means there are five executive abilities, maybe more, but we know of at least five. So self-control isn't one thing, it's five things, and each of them can be called an executive action. Put them all together, you've got the executive system, and by adulthood, you should be using all five of these to get to the future. So we can now link all of these together. Inhibition links up with self-control because you can't direct an action at yourself if you don't stop responding to the world. You can't do both at once. You can't react to an event and control yourself at the same time. You've got to stop doing this one to come back and change yourself. And self-regulation links up with executive functioning, obviously, because self-regulation is comprised of five types of self-control, each an executive function. These are going to develop one at a time. They're going to take 30 years to develop, and each of them is going to need the one before it to develop before it can function. So it's a hierarchy. Think of it as a pyramid. The first one begins at three months of age, and right along with it comes the second. And that is inhibition and the nonverbal system. Now, neuropsychologists have labeled these by these useless terms that you see here. Nonverbal working memory, what the hell is that? <laughs> Verbal working memory. Emotional inhibition, that's a little more obvious. Planning and problem solving, what is that? So what I did in 1994 was after reading papers by Vygotsky, Jacob Bronowski, Luria, and others, my specialty is neuropsychology, hence the reading, I began to see an idea that was taking shape that could be used to help us understand and redefine each of these executive functions. Because, you see, Vygotsky had already developed a model of how language goes from being a public action to others to the voice in your head. So I stole Vygotsky's idea, and I simply said, this must be how all the executive functions develop. Actions to others turn back on the self, and slowly made internal, private. Can we redefine each executive function as an action to the self? Absolutely. And by doing so, we get a much clearer picture of what we're doing with this executive system. Also, just as an aside, we also get a much better picture of how they evolved. How do you get from a primate brain to a human brain? This model can explain it. The earlier neuropsychological terms cannot. So what action are you doing to yourself in terms of nonverbal working memory? You are seeing to yourself. It is the visual imagery system. And humans have the best system for holding images in their mind of any species on this planet. In fact, by 12 months of age, you exceed all other primates. And from there, you will have 10 more years to let this system develop. You have a theater in your mind, a DVD player of the past, which you can activate on demand to see what you have previously done if it would be useful to do so. The layman's term for this is hindsight. You activate images of the relevant past and you hold them in mind. And that's the nonverbal working memory system. But you can also use the other senses to yourself. You can hear to yourself, you can taste to yourself, you can feel to yourself. I can describe the wine I had with dinner last night over at the Delta Hotel by just visualizing the dinner and retasting the Cabernet. If I didn't do that, I couldn't describe it to you. So the image comes first, and then the description. By the way, this is how you can tell people about all the yesterdays of your life. If it wasn't for the images, you couldn't say anything. The words require the images. But it isn't just the images. I can re-sense everything. I can re-hear the conversation with my waiter, and I can re-feel the texture of the napkin or the food or whatever. I can replay the whole event right up here in this theater. Simply put, this is the mind's eye. 
the ability to hold images in mind. And as William James said a hundred years ago, it is the secret of the human will. To understand the human will, one only needs to hold an image in mind, because from that image, everything else flows as a consequence. So the first executive function besides stopping is to re-image the relevant past, hindsight. We'll say more about that in a moment. The next executive function is speech to the self, the Vygotskyan model. I'll teach you that one. Those three are going to lead to the next one. You can emote to yourself. You literally can create emotions de novo in yourself. There is no other species that can do that. Finally, you internalize your manual play, and it becomes the source of the highest executive function, which is planning, problem solving, and simulating multiple possible responses. And you can do it all up here. And it's situated at the foremost frontal pole. It is the capacity to manipulate what you are holding in mind. And that is play. The nice thing about this model is it tells you why children's play is so crucial to adult planning and problem solving. Because manual play moves to symbolic and mental play. And that's the source of all human planning. As I've said, each of these develops in a stepwise sequence, creating a hierarchy of the executive system. Now, this is the Vygotskyan model, so let me explain it to you, because what I'm arguing is that each of these executive abilities follows the same sequence. So let's take speech. Between zero and three years of age, according to Vygotsky, and he's turned out to be correct, young children emit language to others. There is no self-speech, and there certainly is no voice in this head. But between five, excuse me, three and five years of age, you are going to see this young child talk to themselves. And that is measurable. You can videotape three- to five-year-olds engaging in a lot of self-directed outward speech. They are just little chatty Cathys. In fact, if you put two four-year-olds together, it's not a conversation. It's parallel self-speech. <laughs> and if you put this kid to bed at night, you're going to hear them talking in the room even though nobody's there, right? You are witnessing Vygotsky's theory in action. Between five and seven, you are going to start to see the face being suppressed along with the larynx and the utterances. You will see children do this. The mouth is still moving, but you don't get to hear the utterance. Now, speech at this point is going to change in three fundamental ways. It's going to get quieter, as I just illustrated. And it's going to be telegraphic. Once in a while, a word slips out that is perceptible. But the most important change is going to be going from description, young children describe their world, to self-instruction. They start to tell themselves what to do. And at this point, it starts to work. Below five years of age, anything a young child says to themselves has no function. It doesn't work. So they could be sitting there saying, stop, 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 and they'll keep playing the video game. <laughs> Language has not yet captured the motor system. But by five to seven, it has. What you say starts to control what you do. And that is why it's there. Between nine and 12 years of age, this voice is entirely in the mind. But we know that it's still based on self-speech because of research done in the last decade. Let me give you an example. I can put electrodes all over your face, and I can ask you to, slight, to cite your, let's say, Canadian Pledge of Allegiance in your mind. You still move your face. The muscle movements are so small that they're imperceptible to you and to others, but they're measurable. The human face is moving any time you engage in verbal thought. So is your larynx, by the way. But you can't see it. I can't see it but we can now measure it. All verbal thinking is speech to the self with the face suppressed. But you can't suppress it entirely. Little electrical pulses are coming out, and they're activating the muscles around the face in very, very subtle ways. You can ask an athlete to engage in a visual image of an action. Let's take a diver. Or how about just somebody picking up something and throwing it across the room? Do you know that when you imagine that, we can measure your right arm moving. It isn't really moving, but the muscle potentials are all changing in the exact sequence that would be needed to throw that ball. This is why you can use visual imagery to improve athletic performance, because you're using the same system. There is no separate system. You've just kept the actual brain activity 
from going down the spinal cord. But you're using the same part of the brain. When you talk to yourself, you use the speech system. But the only thing different between talking to you and talking to me is that you suppressed your motor strip. Still the same speech system, which is why you can't talk to yourself and talk to others simultaneously, because it's the same damn system, right? But you're just keeping it in your head. That's a neat trick. So it helps us to understand that what Vygotsky was talking about here really shouldn't be called internalization, should be called privatization. Because you're developing the capacity to inhibit public actions and to keep them in the brain. And that gives you a sense of something mental, cognitive, but it's still action to the self no matter what. Now, the first executive function, therefore, that's going to appear at three months of age is the inhibition system, and it is going to shut down that motor system because right alongside it is going to come the visual imagery system, and it needs you to stop what you're doing to hold images in mind so that those images can start to take over your behavior. So the first two executive functions co-develop simultaneously. And by about 12 to 14 years of age, they have reached their adult level of development. You get no more after that. They are early arising. By the way, there's a rule in biology that the earlier a function emerges, the more important it was to the survival of that species, telling us that as humans, visual imagery and inhibition played a very crucial role in human survival. By three years of age, you get the Vygotskyan system, and now you have two means of controlling your behavior, images and words. Those are going to lead to the third system. You are now going to use those images and words to create your own emotional state. You are no longer dependent on the environment around you for your emotions. And then finally, you will internalize your play, and it becomes the source of planning, creativity, innovation, and problem solving. By the way, that's goal-directed creativity, not just artistic or musical. There's a goal to be attained. You've encountered an obstacle. Can you solve the obstacle? Can you invent multiple possible ways around the obstacle to accomplish that goal? And that's based on human play. By 30 years of age, you have this entire system functioning, unless you have ADHD. And then you have a 30 to 40% lag in this entire sequence. The five executive abilities I've just described are going to shift your behavior from the left to the right. As a three-year-old, you are being managed by external events around you. As a 30-year-old, you better be being regulated by your thoughts, by what you are anticipating, by the things you hold in mind. That's a shift from external to internal control. That is going to lead you away from being controlled by others, which three-year-olds are, to self-management. You no longer need other people to wake you up in the morning, for instance. That is going to lead to a third shift. You are going to go from being preoccupied entirely with the now to increasingly being concerned about the future. And the older you get, the further out you anticipate. This is going to go from being a matter of a few hours in early elementary school to about 8 to 12 hours by age 7 or 8 to about 2 to 3 days by adolescence to 12 weeks by the time you're an adult. By age 30, the average decision made by the average adult on the average day is 8 to 12 weeks. That's how far out the average adult anticipates the future. Oh, they can anticipate it further out if it's necessary. But on average, our window on time is two to three months. Just look at your calendars. You'll see when you start to write things in them. That is going to change your behavior from being concerned only with immediate consequences to being concerned with delayed consequences, deferred gratification. So to summarize, this executive system is there to help you self-regulate and organize your behavior across time to anticipate the future. And the future you are anticipating is the social future. The frontal lobe is a social organ. As Diamond argued, it is the seat of our social intelligence. It is where we regulate our social behavior. And it probably emerged initially as a basis for social cooperation. Because we do something very few species do. We live with other members of our species with whom we may not be related, and we share. We cooperate, we reciprocate. But most importantly, we keep score. <laughs> you don't think so? Just stop repaying your favors and see how many friends you have. All right. and test your friendships real quick if you stop reciprocity. So let's take a look at these executive functions very quickly because we're getting a very good idea of what they do. 
The visual imagery system, the ability to sense to yourself, which comes very early, is probably the basis for all human social exchange. We use images to keep track of who we owe and who owes us, and we can usually keep track of about 100 to 150 people in that frontal lobe. You have a giant Excel spreadsheet in your frontal lobe, and it is for bookkeeping. You use images of the past in order to understand who you paid, who owes you, how much, when, and what it's worth. But if you can hold images in mind, even if it originated for this kind of reciprocity and cooperation, you can now copy the behavior of other people. Because all imitation and vicarious learning is based on holding an image of what other people do in your head. And if you can do that, you can use other people's behavior as your own. You don't need to learn things anymore. You can just watch people. And by watching what they do and what happens, you can use what you saw to change yourself. By the way, as I go through this list, each of these is a deficit created by ADHD. There's an interesting prediction. Children with ADHD cannot use the behavior of others to change their own behavior. They can't use the experiences they witness to alter themselves. Oh, they saw it. It just doesn't matter. Other kids can be punished for fighting on the playground. This child will still fight. They will have to experience life firsthand. So they're going to hit the hard knocks a lot more often than other people. This is the system that lets you look back, to look ahead, to get ready. Hindsight, foresight, and anticipation of future events. ADHD children are not going to be doing that very well. And if you look back to look ahead, you get a sense of time. And now you know why ADHD destroys the sense of time. Adult ADHD is the consummate disorder of time management. And that's because people with ADHD cannot use their sense of time. It's part of the frontal lobe deficit. The second executive function, self-speech, is where we talk to ourselves. This is where we reason with ourselves. We self-question. We self-direct rules to ourselves. It's where we internalize the instructions given to us by others or the ones we create ourselves. And they work. They serve to guide our behavior in a rule-governed fashion. People with ADHD will find language to be very weak at influencing their behavior until adulthood. They will be delayed in the ability to use words, language, and instructions as a form of guidance, which is why they don't do what you tell them to do. It's not willful disobedience. It's a failure of language to control the motor system. But this is also the source of reading comprehension, because if you can talk to yourself in your head, you can hold the words you're reading in mind. And that leads to a deeper comprehension of what you've read, heard, or seen. So we should find that adult ADHD is associated with a progressive deficit in comprehending what we read, see, and hear. And then, of course, internal rules are the basis for morality. So we should find some delay in the ability to morally govern our behavior. We've talked about the emotion motivational system, so I won't go any further into that. This is where we modify our emotions and create our motivational states, which is the basis for persistence self-discipline, willpower. Finally, the ability to internalize our play gives rise to the ability to generate multiple options when we are faced with a problem. And if this system isn't working very well, people tend to fall back on overlearned, outdated, ineffective behavior. By the way, this system also involves putting behavior together to solve the problem stringing a sequence of actions together. So we should see that people with ADHD have a lot of trouble with problem solving in their mind, with generating multiple possibilities for getting things done, and then with following the one that's most effective in doing so. But we should also see that they have trouble stringing behavior together in a proper sequence. And we will see this no better than in their speech. Ask a high school student with ADHD to stand up and tell you what they read in history last night, and you will get massive disfluency. This is what it will look like, right? history. I think I read that. Yeah, I did. I know I did. OK. Um, it's in Boston. I'm sure of that. And there's a guy with a horse. Yeah, there's a horse in there. Something about a church and some lanterns. Give me a moment. God, I love horseback riding. You guys like horses? Yeah. We go to Charlottesville, Virginia every summer. Man, is that a cool place, because we have a horse farm down there. And you know, when you're there, if you go there, there's a fantastic barbecue place right at the corner of the downtown. <laughs> and what did you ask me? <laughs> yeah, you're laughing, because what you have just seen are two executive failures. I couldn't hold the goal in mind, that's working memory, and I could not assemble the behavior to attain it. 
And that's this module. So what do you get? You get the correct statements. They're concrete, superficial, out of sequence. And finally, the goal is lost and the conversation has wandered. So you will see a lot of circumlocution and verbal wandering in ADHD adults because they lose the goal they were talking about. And then they can't sequence the information very well either. By the way, you'll see this in writing, you'll see this in speech, and you'll see this in behavior. What does this mean for ADHD? <clears throat> ADHD is not an attention disorder. It's a blindness to the future. It is a myopia to the impending future events. You are nearsighted in time, which means that the child and adult with ADHD are going to wait until the future is imminent. And then they will try to deal with it. But as long as the future stays out there, I don't have to deal with that. The closer it gets, the more I'm going to organize toward it. But I can't really do much about it until it's the 11th hour. And then I will race around, try to slap things together in a hapdash manner to get it done. ADHD creates a nearsightedness to time so that the person with the disorder cannot organize to the delayed future but only to the imminent future. And so everything in life becomes a crisis. But the crisis was avoidable, and no one has any patience with this because they see this as a moral failing. You could have chosen to get ready, but you didn't. It is phrased as a form of laziness, this layabout, ne'er-do-well, carefree, careless attitude that you could change if you wanted to, right? But we know it as the executive failure it really is. This disorder precludes you from organizing across time. So you live in the moment. And you cannot organize very large, hierarchically sequenced behavior across time. It means that future-directed behavior is intentional behavior, which means ADD is actually IDD, intention deficit disorder. I don't seem to be able to accomplish most of the things I intended to do. You can call that a short attention span, but I think intention deficit disorder captures it much better. Now, the frontal lobes, the executive system is where you take what you know and you apply it in your daily life. It is not where you know something. It is where you use what you know. The back part of the brain acquires knowledge. The front, front part of the brain puts it in play. ADHD has separated these two like a meat cleaver. So it really doesn't matter what you know. You can't use it as effectively as other people can. ADHD is a performance disorder. You can't perform the things you know how to do. It is not a knowledge disorder. Most people with ADHD know about as much as anybody else from their neighborhood with their education in that school at that age, but they can't use it, not to anywhere near the degree of effectiveness of others. So people with ADHD know what to do, but they can't do what they know. One of the things we have known in neuropsychology is that if you wish to treat an executive disorder, a performance disorder, the only way to treat it is to change the point of performance. The point of performance is the place out there in life where you should be using this knowledge. And for some reason, you can't seem to do it. So all treatment must be at the point of performance. And if it's not, it won't work. No amount of treatment done away from that place will solve that problem. Only changing that place will solve that problem. You have to restructure the environment to help them show what they know. So what does this mean? It means that teaching skills is a waste of time because they won't be used. Skills are knowledge, and these people already have most of the skills anyway. But even if you teach them new ones, the likelihood that they will get implemented is pretty slim. I can hand any adult a list of time management recommendations, and I can guarantee you that most of them will never get used. In fact, the paper will be lost on the way home because it will blow up <laughs> under the front seat of the car, and then you'll forget that it's there. Or if you do remember that it's there, you'll tape it to the refrigerator, but you won't look at it. And if you do, you'll say, you know, I really should be doing those things. These are really cool things. This is what I really need help with. And then you'll just go about behaving impulsively anyway, and you'll come back in and say, you know, Dr. Barkley, those were great ideas. Did you do them? Well, I'm working on it. Boy, I find that hard to do. You see what I'm talking about? This is not a knowledge disorder. It never was. It's a problem with using what you know. And no sheet of paper corrects for a performance disorder. You have to design the point of performance around the individual. The phrase we like to use is designing prosthetic environments. We're going to use prostheses, little artificial things around the patient, in order to help them. I'll give you some suggestions in a moment. But let's remember that the most effective treatment is done where the problem occurs, not away from the problem. 
This means that medication is going to be needed for most cases of ADHD because we now know how medications alter genes in the brain to change these neural networks. So that drugs like the stimulants and atomoxetine are actually forms of genetic therapy. They literally are, mo are modifying the neurogenetic impact of the disorder in the brain. Unfortunately, like insulin, they only do it temporarily, only while they're in the bloodstream in the brain. And once they wash out, the brain goes back to being the executive deficit brain that it was previously. But this gives a very clear rationale for why medications are essential for this disorder. This is not a socially created construct that we're using medication as a band-aid to paper over as if we were putting mental straitjackets on people with ADHD. Medication can now be rephrased as neurogenetic intervention. Now, I just made a case for being excused from the consequences of your actions, but I really haven't. Because, you see, in this theory, the most important thing is not the consequences. It was the delay to the consequence. What hurts people with ADHD is that most natural consequences of any importance are delayed. And the longer they're delayed, the more disabled you become. So the way to deal with ADHD is not to dismiss consequences. That would make it worse. It is to tighten up the accountability, to bring those consequences closer in time, more frequent, more immediate, more salient accountability over time. That's what we're going to talk about in my next lecture. So the point here isn't to dismiss accountability, it's to tighten it up. Individuals with ADHD need more, not less, accountability. So we're going to need to modify points of performance and create little prosthetic devices, and behavior modification becomes one means of doing so. So you now know why we have to do behavior modification, because it creates artificial environments that weren't previously there in order to compensate for these executive deficits. But because we have to change the natural environment, the success of any treatment is contingent on the compassion of other people in that environment. How willing are they to help you modify the point of performance? And if they're not on board, and if they're not willing or compassionate, it's going to be very difficult. Not impossible, but quite difficult. So we come to view ADHD, therefore, like diabetes, a long-term chronic disorder that can be successfully managed, but it requires modifying environments, lifestyles, behaviors of the individual. So a chronic disability view of ADHD is a much better view than the attention deficit view of ADHD. So to summarize, we can think of ADHD as a disorder of inhibition that disrupts the executive system and leads to failures in self-regulation. And since the purpose of the executive system is to organize over time and get ready for the futures in life, that is what ADHD is robbing the individual of a capacity to do. Organize across time to the future. Now, how can we change that point of performance? Well, if you can't hold things in mind, put them outside of you. You need to externalize key pieces of information at these crucial points in life. This is where sticky notes, charts, lists, cards, reminders, PDAs, computers, anything you can think of. I don't care. The issue here is not what you do. It's why you have to do it. ADHD has destroyed the working memory system. You can't hold things in mind, so don't. Write them down. One of the most effective things an adult with ADHD can do is carry a journal that is chained to your body if necessary. And in it, you will write what you agree to do and what others tell you to do, and that is your working memory. You are going to use an external resource to compensate for an internal working memory problem. So whether it's digital memory recorders, whether it's a journal, whether it's cards, whether it's notes, you need to do it. I remember being picked up once at the airport in Cedar Falls, Iowa, by a drug rep who was adult ADHD, a friend of mine. And I got in the car and he picked me up and I looked at the dashboard and I was stunned. You know what was on that dashboard? <laughs> 60 sticky notes. 60, right. Spread all over the dashboard. Now, I understood that. He had all his notes at the point of performance and they were in the right sequence in which he had to call on these various docs and get things done. What concerned me to no end is he'd cover the speedometer. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I knew I was in trouble then. Right? As we will see in my next presentation, driving is a major problem. But the point is this. The more externally represented the information is, the more compelling it is, and the more likely it is to elicit the action you need to do. You need to be using external prompts and cues, however you do it. Now, you have no internal clock that you can reliably call upon. You have a distortion in the internal sense of time. 
So you're going to need external temporal references. Young children will need cooking timers. Older adults may need watches that vibrate and go off at various hours. You may need computers with Outlook that signals you 20 to 30 minutes before a deadline. But you are going to need to use external temporal guidance devices, things like week-at-a-glance calendars, PDAs, and other means of organizing your life. But time must be represented externally and not just rely on your internal sense of time. You cannot anticipate that future and deal with it across time. So the best thing to do is to break the future into pieces and do a piece a day. And other people can help you do this. So take the long-term goals, break them into their baby steps, go back to those little mini behavioral structures I showed you that the frontal lobe is supposed to be organizing the higher level structures and do a step a day, a sequence a day. And then you can have baby steps across time and when the future gets here, you're ready. All of that will be for nothing if you don't have some external means of motivating you to do these things. So you need to arrange for consequences around you for getting things done. One of the best ways to do that is to make yourself accountable to others because social consequences can be very motivating. But you may also need to arrange other privileges, other rewards that you find interesting, valuable, in order for you to get your goals done. And these things need to be soon, immediate. Don't tell yourself that if I work for a month, I'm going to allow myself to go out and buy some new clothes or get some iPhone or iPod or download a music or whatever. This needs to be something within the day, not outside the day. The nearer you bring the consequence, the more motivating it will be. You also need to use manual problem solving. So if you have things that need to get done, instead of just doing them in your head, Try to do them with your hands as much as you can as well. Take mental arithmetic. Instead of striving to do it up here, you could be doing it with physical things. You could have marbles, a number line, and a bacchus, a calculator, or the calculator in the laptop. You're going to need some external means of representing and manipulating the problem. So however best you are able to do that, try to do so. But this is how you solve the five executive difficulties by going backward in their development. They were once external, they have become internal. We need to make them external once again. And if we do that, along with medication, you should be able to compensate for these executive problems. But if you persist in viewing ADHD as an attention disorder, you will learn nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm a little late. Oh,